From a TV appearance on Blind Date in 1993 to a distinguished career as a male stripper, traveling all over the UK and Europe, he went on to become one of the UK's most successful online health and fitness coaches, helping hundreds of clients in the last 15 years to health and weight loss success. His techniques have helped people lose body fat with ease, increase their energy, improve their health, and give them the weight loss goals that they have always wanted. Welcome to the show, Gav. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Thanks, Toby. Thanks for being on the show. It's um, great to be here. Thank you. Thank you so, so much for joining me today on this episode of Mirror Talk Podcast. Um, I really find your story very fascinating from, you know, being a stripper for 17 years from the age of 19 to now becoming one of UK's most successful online health fitness coaches on LinkedIn. So, can you, can you share your life story with me? How did this all go about? Yeah, absolutely. So I think <clears throat> yeah, from a very young age, I was always into health and fitness and sport. It's really football. Football was my first love. Mm. Um, but then I loved cricket, rugby, te- all sports. I loved playing up until, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13. And then about 14 or 15, <clears throat> I discovered bodybuilding. I would started reading some of the the magazines with a, you know, with a big muscle guys in. I remember thinking, that's what I want to do. I, I really loved the idea of, you know, bodybuilding. And this is in the late, mid to late eighties. I'm showing my age now. <clears throat> At age fifteen, I really discovered bodybuilding. Uh, Madonna. I was a big fan of Madonna back in the day, and she used to come over from the states, and she was famously seen running around Hyde Park uh, with two big bouncers. Um, with the words personal trainer mm. written across their T-shirt. So I remember thinking, personal trainer, is that a thing? Could you actually become a, a celebrity personal trainer? So that's what I wanted to do. I knew very quickly I would, I'd would i love training. So if I could make a living working in a gym. So I went into my work experience in a gym for a couple of days, and that really you know, got the idea of thinking, okay, this is something I could do as a career. But how I changed and ended up doing stripping for 17 years was yeah. was quite amusing. So I, I signed up to do my degree. Mm-hmm. I was due to start my degree in so September 93. Um, early on that year, I'd been working part-time in a gym. So between my A-levels and going to university, I took a year out. I was working part-time as a, a fitness instructor in the local uh, leisure center. Mm-hmm. Um, three or four days a week in this gym, learning the ropes of what a personal trainer would would be. And I saw this advert on the staff notice board, and it said auditions for blind dates. Now, back in the late 80s, early 90s, Blind Date was the number one TV show in in the UK. Like it was 17, 18 million on a Saturday night would watch it. Everyone watched Blind Date. And I don't know if you're familiar with the show and how it works. There'd be a girl and then a screen and three guys would be lined up and then she would ask these questions to the guys and based off the answers, she would then pick who she wanted to go on this blind date with. Mm. Long story short, she picked me. But if I back up slightly, when I went to the first audition, I thought, how can I make sure I get on TV? In my head, I have have to get on. I need to do anything I can to get on. Yeah. So I so I bullshitted them and told them I was a stripper, <laughs> <laughs> which yeah. was only a half a lie, because mm. what the truth was, about six weeks before the TV audition, I'd actually been for the audition to become mm. a stripper. Mm. I'd been along for the audition, said right, you can do this. We're going to give you some job. But I hadn't been given a job, mm. so it was a half a lie. So I told them I was a stripper. I went through the first audition, no problem. Second one, third one, got the letter in the post said I was due to be on TV at this day. So I, I half lied to get onto the show. Anyway, did the show, and then went to university in '93 for three years. But in that meantime, started doing strips on the weekend, like very part-time. So I was a student full-time. And then on the Fridays and Saturdays, I had this little part-time gig of, you know, when it was, say, a girl's birthday or um, 
a hen party or a bachelorette party, as the Americans call it, you know, mm. or I would turn up in a club, a pub, a restaurant and, you know, in a costume, do five, 10 minutes, dance around and get paid a load of cash. Yeah. And it was just very, very part time. And then true story, two weeks before I was due to graduate, a friend of mine who had started working with probably the UK's equivalent to the Chippendales, which were the big group in the 90s and 2000s, the biggest strip group in the world, really. He started working with this group and he called me up and he said, Gav, we, we've got a 12-week tour um, all over Europe, starting in Belgium, the Netherlands, uh, France, Germany, everywhere. And we need one more guy to join the team. Yeah. And I said, um, I've got to start and finish this 10,000 word dissertation right now. Yeah. Um, he said, when do you need to know? I said, when do you need to know? And he said, today. I went, fuck it, I'm in. <laughs> so I just dropped my degree, <laughs> went over and did this tour. Yeah. But the tour collapsed after 11 days. Mm. And we didn't, get, we didn't get paid any money. So I had to come back to England yeah. No money, no tour, and I just finished my degree. Mm. But it was the, the best move I could have done because that was the start of, you know, what became so part time from ninety three to ninety six, yes. and then from ninety six to two thousand eight, it was a full time. Sorry, two thousand ten, mm. it was a full time career for me. So, what's that? Fourteen years full time, seventeen years part-time and yeah. I didn't want to give up I got to age 30 I thought I need to I need to quit this and get a, <laughs> get on with my career but I, I couldn't stop I got to 35 in 2008 and I okay I'm gonna to have to go to London moved to London and started working full-time as a personal trainer in the city yeah. and I haven't looked back and I've been doing the training with clients full-time since 2008. So it's been a full-time thing for me for 13 years now. So there's my story in about, in about 10 minutes. Wow, wow, that's so fascinating. But if I may ask, what, what's um, you know, attracted you to become a male um, stripper? What's motivated you to you know, go down that line? I was at 17, 18. Mm. I was in quite good shape. Fancied myself a bit. Mm. Very confident, probably too confident, a little bit arrogant. Okay. And I saw, I saw it. I thought I could, I could do that. Is that yeah. a thing? It's just confidence, really. It's also, I like performing. Um, it wasn't really. I didn't intend to be a stripper. I really, mm. when I went and did my degree in sports and exercise science, mm. there was part of me that wanted to do performance arts or acting or dancing or that, that type of work. Yeah. So, but when I did the sports exercise science, I think the stripping enabled me to keep that little artistic element of me still going. Mm. And throughout the whole of that 17 years, I was doing small bits of TV. I'd auditioned for films, for some commercials, some adverts, and I'd got very, very minor roles and parts and it was always a name it wasn't a name to be a stripper that was just keeping me able to to do whatever i wanted to do yeah. it was good fun it was good money and i could audition for different things as and you know along the way without having a real job yeah. but then when i got to 35 and i didn't become the next brad pitt i realized that um i probably wasn't going to become famous and i wasn't my heart wasn't set on being a famous actor enough i wasn't trained it was almost like a if I can make it without doing any work, great. Mm, if yes. I'm going to have to go to study acting, I wasn't going to do that. So mm. I thought, what do I know really well? I got my degree, qualified as a personal trainer, qualified as a nutritionist. Yeah. I'd kept doing courses and studying along the way. So mm -hmm. as soon as I finished, I was ready to go straight into to what I should have been doing mm. when I was um, 22, 23. Yes, yes. And I'm, I'm so glad that, you know, at the age of 35, you, you know, changed course and you started helping people's life, um, you know, in the health and fitness sector. So far, you, 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 you help, you know, busy men and women lose 20 pounds or more in 12 weeks or less without, you know, cutting out carbs, without, you know, losing out on the fun stuff of their lives. And um, you, you packed a lot of insights, a lot of this insight into your book called The GHG Method. There we go. 
Wow, that's the awesome. GHG method. Yes. So this is really the, the written version of what I would teach in in my coaching. Now, the difference between uh, a book and, and real coaching, like mm. everything I coach, you can get for free on the internet. Yeah. But if you think about all the information anyone needs, it's all free. Mm. There's nothing new. It's all free on the internet. We can type in within less than half a second. We can get the answer to nearly everything. Mm. But the difference between reading a book and real coaching, because I get loads of clients come from the book. Mm. They read the book and then decide, you know what, that's great. But information is just information. Yeah. Without the implementation, mm. uh, you need the implementation to get the results. And that's what coaching does. So, you know, my whole there's a lot of misconceptions, a lot of myths mm. in fitness. You know, you've probably heard eating carbs after 7 p.m. or um, having loads of small meals or, you know, cardio. what's the best cardio, all the different things that people don't understand. So my job mm. is to, one, tell them the truth about mm -hmm. how to lose weight, mm -hmm. do it in a way that they enjoy, and if I can make them laugh along the way, if you've seen any of my videos, you'll know yeah. I, you know, like to not take things too seriously. Yes, yes. Um, and take the piss out of people and joke about a serious topic, but at the same time inform people. Yes. So that's what we do. I, I highly recommend that also. Like your YouTube channel is full of a lot of information and a lot of fun stuff. I'll place a link to your YouTube channel in the show notes for this episode so everyone could just check it out. So please. Yeah, thank you. For, for listeners out there, can you tell us what GHG stands for and what are the methods that we could implement from this that could help, you know, busy clients to lose weight or to keep it off for good? Well, the GHG is my initials, my name. So, mm. um, Gavin, uh, middle name is Howard. Mm. Shh, don't tell anyone that. <laughs> um, and the surname is Gillibrand, Gav Gillibrand, so GHG. I, I was, when I was trying to come up with the idea of the book, I thought, what do I call this? Mm -hmm. I thought, you know what, let's call it the GHG method. And that's kind of what I say. So this is just what I subscribe to. And the, the top tips, if someone was trying to lose weight, mm -hmm. the first thing we would look at that is get them to track their calories. Mm -hmm. now, I know that if someone's got 10 pounds or 50 pounds to lose, mm -hmm. They're consuming more calories than they're burning. That's simply how people gain weight. So they absolutely need to start tracking their calories. And most people have got no idea, you know, how many grams of protein, fats, and carbs they're eating. They don't know how many calories are in one gram of protein. Mm. So it's like we teach them the basics. We get them to start tracking their calories, and then we can reduce the calories a little bit. And if they start to lose weight, we know that they're in a calorie deficit. And the calorie deficit, you've probably seen me talk about it, is where you're burning more calories than you're taking in. Yes. So if you're in a calorie deficit, you will lose weight every time. Now, if mm. you're in a calorie surplus, that's where you're eating more food than you're burning, mm. that's when we gain fat. If you're equal, that's when your weight stays the same. And most people over the week do a mixture of both. They eat more than they burn, then they eat a little bit less, and it kind of balances out. Mm. And so if your weight is stable, you're kind of automatically doing that without even knowing. Mm. If someone's got a lot of weight to lose, we absolutely need to get them into that calorie deficit. Now, that's where the, it becomes a bit tricky because most people know they need to eat a little bit less food. But the psychological aspect of fat loss is very, very hard. Mm. You know, why do most people struggle with their weight? It was one, they don't know the basics, what we mm. talked about. But two, Maybe they've had some, some sort of trauma and they're addicted to food. Maybe their self-image is very low. Maybe their self-esteem is low. Maybe they've got some self-limiting beliefs about whether they can lose weight, mm -hmm. whether they think it's possible, whether they deserve it. You know, and, and a lot of people, not everyone, so if you're, if you're overweight and you, you're very, very confident, that's not you. But a lot of people that have got a lot of weight to lose don't feel good about themselves. So they've lost a little bit of confidence and when you've lost confidence, you try something that doesn't work, then that gives them a, you know, proof that them trying to lose weight doesn't work. Yeah. So it makes them stop even trying to lose weight and they eat more food and they get caught on this cycle of eat more food, feel guilty, try a diet, it doesn't work, mm. eat more food. Mm. So the weight goes up and up and up. So the actual mechanics of losing body fat are extremely simple. Mm. But the actual 
notion of losing body fat for many people is very very hard does that make sense yeah it does make sense yeah yes and i i would encourage everyone to get the ghg method book so that you could get like you know the the detailed method uh, of losing weight and keeping it off for good that would be awesome. yes that's it that's the key yeah yeah. So how would you advise, you know, people, especially very busy people to improve their, their health and fitness while, you know, juggling a very busy life of career, business, family, friends and other um, commitments? Absolutely. It's a, good, it's a good question. And a lot of my clients are exactly the same. They say to me when they start, you know, I want to lose weight, but I, one, I don't know what to eat and I'm mm. very, very busy. I don't have the time. Mm. Well, Toby, you know, we all make time for what's important for us. Yes. You know. If you're watching Netflix for one hour a night, mm -hmm. you've got time to exercise. Mm -hmm. And most people, you know, they haven't got time for this, haven't got time for that. You only need half an hour a day, 20 mm -hmm. minutes a day, yeah. a brisk walk, some press-ups, some squats in your bedroom. Nice. Everyone has time, but they might not think they've got time. Yeah. And it doesn't need much. So you just need to get people moving, like mm -hmm. three walks a week, three brisk walks a week. Is better than nothing, and when they couple that with what they put into their mouth, there's still enough to get results. And I would say nearly all of my clients have got um, their business owners, CEOs, entrepreneurs with kids, two or three children. Mm -hmm. They're busy people, and we've all got 24 hours in the day. Mm -hmm. But when you show them the benefits and how, because a lot of people think, they need to be at the gym five days a week for yeah. one hour. Mm -hmm. That's the misconception. They don't. So what happens is they think, well, I haven't got five hours. Mm -hmm. I can't do this. <clears throat> when I explain to them, they only need two or three 30 minutes a week. They're like, mm -hmm. oh, I can, I can do that. You know, mm -hmm. I can, I've got more time than I realize. Then once they get some consistency going, they start losing a few pounds. Mm -hmm. They realize they've actually got more time. They're just spending it doing other things. Mm -hmm. So once people start to see results and see the benefits, more time suddenly appears. Like, mm. you know, where your attention goes, energy flows, mm. and results show. Tony mm. Robbins said that originally. You know, whatever you focus on, things come towards you. If you focus on exercise, you find time, you start to enjoy it a bit more. So it's all about helping people realize they don't have to spend their whole life mm. exercising. They don't have to eat. Every meal does not have to be totally healthy they can mm. still enjoy some of the bad stuff so to speak the stuff that hasn't got as many nutrients so it's, it's teaching them that they don't have to be perfect mm. they can still lose body fat yeah. and still have a life still eat some carbohydrates and still have plenty of time for their work and their family so i, I did like you know some you know, some food that one has to avoid for example if one wants to lose weight are there like some, you know, some do's and don'ts that you could um, just tell us about? The reason people get such great results on my program is mm. that I don't tell them to not eat anything. Um, if they want to have pizza, yes, yes. they can have it, but mm. they've just got to control the families, the, the calories. The problem when you start demonizing certain foods, people then think this food's good and that food's bad. Mm. I want to try and get people away from thinking about good and bad and thinking about that food has got empty calories. Mm -hmm. This food has got calories with nutrients. Mm -hmm. So we want to focus on most of the foods with nutrients, mm -hmm. but it won't be a problem to have some of the foods, and that's usually things like pizza, cake, biscuits, you know, uh, cookies, all the stuff that we enjoy, yes. but they're empty calories. Now, there's nothing wrong with them as long as we – equate for the calories as long as we count those calories into our daily target mm -hmm. someone can still be in a calorie deficit at the end of the week yes yes I, 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 that makes me remember you know, these weight watchers for example they're like giving points to different kinds of food and you know trying to balance it up so that you can either lose some calories or gain some calories depending on what you are um, trying to achieve um for yeah. weight gain yeah or weight loss yes department okay so as a, as a very busy man that you are you know you're a family man and uh, you have a lot of business that you you manage and yes that you do can you walk me through like some quick and easy ways to this to decrease stress increase energy and have laser focus and um, laser sharp focus all day long first thing i would do is go to bed and get up at the same time every day mm. that's one of the best things because your body likes routine 
and it will set your circadian rhythm. Circadian rhythm is just really the, the rhythm, your internal clock. Mm. So when you go to bed late and then get up early and then go to bed early and get up late, it, it messes the system up. So I try, not always, try to go to bed at 10 or 10.30 mm. and get up at 5 or 5.30 every day, seven days a week. Mm. That would be the first thing. So you're getting good quality sleep. So let actually back up from that. We want to have the best quality sleep possible. Mm. So you wake up feeling good. Then your morning routine is the absolute key. You want to hydrate. So like, you know, 500 mils of good water mm. before you have your coffee or your tea. Make sure you get hydrated first. And then I like to go to the gym. I like to exercise, but that might not suit everyone else's schedule. Mm -hmm. But some of the tactics for keeping stress-free and being focused is journaling. Mm -hmm. Is writing your goals and intentions in your journal, mm -hmm. talking about your day, what you could have done better, mm -hmm. what you need to focus on. The very act of putting that pen to paper mm -hmm. In that pen and actually physically writing down. Yes. It's been proven, scientifically proven, to reduce stress, um, improve um, vocab and comprehension of different things. So journaling is one of my top tips. Um, you could go down the meditation route. I've mm -hmm. done meditation sometimes, but I don't do it all the time. Um, do you meditate, Toby? Do you any meditation? Yes, but not, not all the time. Like I do some. Not all the time, time, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, focus, good quality nutrition is the key. Mm. Lots of protein will help you keep focused. But the main thing is getting to bed on time, getting up, um, good quality coffee or tea, Yeah. Um, lots of water, mm. And journaling, that's the way I like to start my day, get my goals and intentions ready. Yes. So I know as soon as I start my work day, I'm going to be able to focus on what I want. But you have to set good goals as well. You can't, mm. you know, people say they want to be focused. Okay, well, what are you focused on? Mm. Well, I'm just working. No, you need to set your goals and say, today I'm going to work on this mm -hmm. and then tackle that hardest task first. So, I mean, this is such a big, big topic, but that would yes. be the first start. Yeah, first, the first things to start with. Yes, and that's, that works awesomely well for you because you have like a six-figure business in health and um, fitness sector. So how are you able to, you know, build up this, this business, especially on, on LinkedIn? How are you able to do that on LinkedIn? So the, the way to build on LinkedIn is mm -hmm. one of the most, it's a powerful platform. Mm -hmm. Most people misunderstand it. It's not as sexy as Instagram or Facebook or YouTube because there are no pictures. It's more business. But the great thing is it's very organic. So... You need to be posting regular content. If, mm. if you've got a service or a business or a product or something you're trying to sell, mm. people need to see it. So you need to post every single day, maybe twice a day, depending mm. if you can do that. But you also need to comment on other people's posts. The way LinkedIn works, the more you comment on people's posts, their posts will get shown to you more. Mm. So the more you're commenting, people will click through to your profile and think, who's that? Mm. So you can have the best product in the world, mm. but unless people see it, yeah. it doesn't mean anything. Like, you know, so you have to get people to see it. And when they see it, they'll click through, they'll make connections, start conversations. Mm. It's called social media for a reason. We need to be social. So the more you're talking to people, they're talking back to you. You can build up a relationship. Then you can sell them your product. They get results. So that's how that's how it works. Yeah. And I've been I've been on LinkedIn full time now for about three years. Mm. I'd say three years. Wow, and that's that's always been you know a good experience for you. Or are there like some um, skills that one has to learn in order to you know apart from you know posting twice a day, for example, how, how, how am I supposed to you know format my you know post to make it attractive to people to click on? Are there like some you know some strategies to that? A good thing is the title will mean everything. You've got to do a title that makes people want to read. Mm. So also a good little tip is if you do a title and then press return about five times. Yes. So then they see the title and it will say more, dot, dot, dot. Mm. So if you do the title and then start speaking or writing straight underneath it, mm -hmm. if they don't read the first right line, but when they see the title and think, oh, that's interesting, mm -hmm. and then see more, then they're likely to click into it and then they'll read. So then you've got to have good copy. Yeah. You've got to actually write to them 
Um, they've, it's got to be informative. Mm. It's got to be amusing, maybe. It's got to be maybe share about your family. Mm. Um, so you can, it doesn't just have to be business. Mm. If you're honest about yourself, um, tell people what you failed in or what's not working. People love to get to really know you. And the, the trick with social media, I think personally, is to be yourself. Mm. Yeah. Be yourself. And I think the trick in life is to be yourself. Right? Mm. Most people, not most people, many people are trying to be someone they're not. Mm. And when they're being someone they're not, it, one, it's, it's not genuine. People recognize that they can tell they're not being themselves. And mm. three, you're trying to be something that you don't even know what anyone likes. If you're yourself every time, yeah. The people that resonate with what you're saying will be attracted to you. They'll become clients or friends mm. or colleagues or they'll mm. buy your service. Mm. The people that don't resonate with you and however good or amazing you are, look, the most popular movie star in the world mm. is loved by hundreds of millions of people. He's also hated by hundreds of millions of people. True. So the more popular you get, the more people are going to dislike you. The yeah. better you get at anything, mm -hmm more people are still going to dislike you. So you have to be exactly who you are. Mm. The people that resonate with your message, they like you. They think this guy's cool. I like him. I'll become part of his circle. I'll follow him. Mm. That's who you're talking to. You're not talking to the people that don't like you because whatever you do, mm. people are not going to like you. That's true. That's very true. Wow. So that was the, one of the biggest tips for social media. No, a lot of people... And you can see when they're trying to be something else. Mm -hmm. You can say, I know that you don't talk like that. Like, mm -hmm. as we've got to know each other on this podcast, yes. and you've seen my videos, I'm exactly the same on my videos yes. as I am in the flesh. Exactly. You know, mm -hmm. I, there's no, that's not a pretend the video. This isn't pretend. This is how I am in normal life. To, mm -hmm. Same to everyone. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if you're the CEO of a billion dollar company mm -hmm. or you're a dustman or you clean the floors, I will treat you exactly the same. I've got as much respect for you as the next person. Mm. And that's how I put my message. So I'm myself, but it will upset some people. I'll say stuff that people don't enjoy, mm. but I can't help that. I won't intentionally go out of my way to upset someone. I'm not going to think, okay, what can I put? This is going to upset this person. That's not my aim. But by being yourself yes. and getting your message out to the world, mm. you're going to step on a few toes. True. And that's okay because that's in their head and it's nothing to do with you. Make sense? It makes sense. It makes sense. Just be you, do you, and let the world like you or hate you. You do you and I'll do me. Yes. That's it. Yes, that's awesome. Thank you so much for that. That's good. You're welcome. So, I think that's good, good, good advice for life, really. Yes, yes, that's true. So from your, from your experience with working with over 37,000 followers on LinkedIn and also from your online coaching, um, what are like some common mistakes that you've experienced that people make when it comes to elderly living, for example, or losing weight? They, a lot of people still think carbohydrates mm. are the problem. Yeah. True. Still. It's one of the biggest myths. And when, when people, a lot of people say they're going to go on a diet, what's the first thing they cut? They go, I'm keeping my carbs down. Like I've got a holiday in six weeks. I'm going to cut my carbs. I hear it every week of the year. Mm. Carbs are not the problem. Carbs and sugar are not making people fat. The problem with carbs and sugar is that they're very easy to overeat because they taste good. Mm. It's very hard to overeat protein. Like no one goes and eats 10 eggs or three chicken breasts or mm. four steaks. You don't overeat. But if you put a bag of Doritos mm. in front of me, a movie bag, I'll eat the whole bag. Mm. If you give me a donut, I'll eat three. Yes. If you give me a McDonald's, I'll have a Big Mac, fries, a milkshake, yeah. everything. It's easy to eat 2,000 calories when it's protein, when it's fat and carbs. Yes. It's harder to overeat protein. So it tastes good. Um, so people think if I cut that out, I'm going to lose weight. Now, what happens is when people reduce carbohydrates and they cut the fat out of their diet, mm. yes, they lose weight, but it was because they reduced the calories. Mm not because it was the carbs. Yeah. So carbs won't make people fat. It's the total calories that will make someone fat. Mm -hmm. So your whole diet, I think there was a guy about five or six years ago did an experiment. He ate nothing but McDonald's for a whole week, for a whole month. Mm -hmm. And he lost weight. 
<laughs> oh. <laughs> it's not very healthy because mm. McDonald's tastes good, but it's junk. It's crap food. So, but he was in a calorie deficit. So you, you could eat a, a Big Mac and fries, probably about a thousand calories. Mm. If you ate a thousand calories a day, Toby, you would lose loads of weight. Mm. Now, would you have very good energy? No. no. Would you feel good? Probably not. Your skin might be bad. Your insides, it'd be terrible. It's like, geez, horrible food. Tastes good. So it's, it's a lot of the myths. Most people still believe carbs make them fat. Um, what else? A good myth around cardio, and 20 years ago, this is what we believed, mm -hmm. that doing cardio on an empty stomach mm -hmm. helps you burn more body fat than doing cardio, say, after breakfast. Mm -hmm. So fasted cardio against non-fasted cardio. Yes. They're both exactly the same. Mm -hmm. doesn't make any difference. Because mm -hmm. what matters is the total calories you eat over the whole day. So what happens in, when you're fasted and do your cardio I say you wake up, you've had dinner 7 p.m. the night before, wake up 6 o'clock in the morning, go to the gym for a run on the treadmill. Mm -hmm. You will burn more fat in the session, fasted, mm -hmm. but then you'll burn less fat over the rest of the day when you start to eat. If you have breakfast, then do cardio, you'll burn less fat because you've got that meal in your stomach. Mm -hmm but your fat will increase over the rest of the day. So it'll be identical. If you eat the same calories, mm -hmm. your, your net fat loss will be the same at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah. So the only thing that will determine your fat loss is total calories. So if you reduce your calories, doesn't matter whether you do fasted or non-fasted, what will matter is are you in a negative calorie deficit at the end of the day? It all boils down to the, to the calories at the end of the day, like always calories. So from your experience, you know, from your online coaching, for example, um, are there like some limiting or some self-limiting beliefs that are related to fat loss? Well, it really depends on where that person is coming from and what experience they've had. Mm. So, again, this is not everyone. Let's say someone struggled with their weight for mm. 10, 15, 20 years. Yeah. They've always been overweight. They, as a teenager, they were overweight. Mm. They've grown up being overweight. Their parents mm. might be overweight. Mm. The people they hang around with tend to be overweight. Mm. They don't like the gym. Mm. They love junk food. Look, if you're, if you're 300 pounds, you didn't do that overnight. That's taken <laughs> 10, 20 years to get there. Yeah. So, again, not everyone. So, But most people that are 300 pounds mm. tend to have a poor self-image. Their standards are quite low around health and nutrition. Yeah. Maybe their self-esteem's taken a, a knock. Their confidence might be low. Mm. So what usually happens is if they try and go on a diet, because they've tried everything before anyway, mm. what that means is they've tried a few things, it didn't work, so they think they've tried everything. Yeah. So a lot of the self-limiting beliefs I hear from these people is I've tried everything before and nothing works, or my bones I've got big bones or mm. it's my genetics yes. or my parents are fat. So it's not my fault. Mm. Look, if you're 300 pounds for most people it is their fault. They've mm. overeaten. I'm not blaming them because there's a lot of issues around that. Maybe they've had some trauma. Maybe they've, maybe they were abused as a child. Maybe they were, had some real issues as a youngster and it's caused this problem. But mm. ultimately Somewhere along the lines, they've still eaten too much food. Yeah. So what's happened has caused them to do that. So ultimately, it is their fault because they've done it. That's not to say that we can't empathize with them and help them and help them discover why they've done that. But ultimately, it has come down to them. Unless they've been force-fed by someone else, yeah. it is them because they've eaten the food. Yes. Does that make sense? That might seem a bit harsh, but it's the truth. Mm. They've eaten the food. Does that mean that they're a bad person? No. Can they lose weight? Everyone can lose weight. Yes. But their belief is they can't mm. because they've tried everything. Mm. It's their genetics. Um, it's not my fault. It's my hormones. It's the drugs I'm taking. Mm. These are all self-limiting beliefs. But the problem with self-limiting beliefs is that they prove themselves. They've, ha they've got proof from their own evidence of trying and failing. Mm. So this is where the self-sabotage comes in. Yeah. So what yeah. happens is they start to lose weight everything's working well. They're sleeping well, eating well, going to the gym. And then someone makes a comment 
oh, have you lost weight? Don't lose too much weight now. <laughs> and a little alarm bell goes off in their head and they think, oh shit, I better not lose too much. Mm -hmm. They go back. So even getting success can become uncomfortable for someone mm -hmm. because they've spent 20 years being comfortably uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah. So even though they're uncomfortable, they feel safe being uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And maybe, not always, and I haven't met many people, but I've met a couple of clients that have had a real traumatic experience as a youngster whether it was abuse yeah. or sexual abuse or physical abuse from their parents mm -hmm. so they've used food as a crutch yeah. and they've got very very overweight now if someone's been sexually abused maybe being overweight makes them feel comfortable because if they lose weight they in their head maybe that person would if they're overweight they're invisible mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah, yeah so yes. if if no one can see them no one's going to cause them any problems. True. I had that with one client. But if they get more attractive, lose weight, start to feel good, they become more visible and they might, so that might happen again. Mm. That's an extreme example, but that's very common. I've had it a couple of times. So that means probably every trainer or coach has had that, which means it's thousands of people all over the world have had horrible, horrible things happen to them. Mm. That's just one part. Like there's so many reasons why people overeat, like, no one wants to be obese. No one. Anyone that's got a lot of weight to lose does not want to be there. And they're not happy there. They would love to be able to get to, you know, what we consider an ideal weight or an attractive. Everyone wants that. Of course they do. Yeah. We're human. Yeah. So they don't like being there, but it could be comfortable. It could be more comfortable to be there than it is mm. to actually go to where they want to go. Mm. And that's where the psychological aspect of fat loss um, comes into and that's the hard bit the actual mm -hmm. mechanics reduce your calories mm -hmm. exercise that's easy yeah but the psychological aspect of it that's very hard and how do you advise someone who has this kind of um, psychological you know challenge like to change am I there like some you know medical assistance that could be rendered or I'd like some um, help you could also render from your online coaching yeah well it really depends on the level like if someone's got some real trauma going on that's mm. probably i'm probably not the best person suited for that yeah. they're going to need maybe some counseling or um a a psychiatrist or therapists mm. of some sort mm. if they're willing to work through that once they start to see some results because usually a lot of people have tried everything which means they haven't tried the calorie deficit if we get them to start losing weight if someone loses 10 or 15 pounds in the first three four weeks mm it gives that person some confidence. They think, I, I can lose weight. I can do that. Yeah. And then once they get confidence, we can start to help them. And if they can lose 20, 30 pounds in 12 weeks and get changed the way they look at themselves, once they get a little bit of confidence, maybe their self-esteem gets a bit higher. Their self-image, they start to wear smaller clothes. They get confidence. Mm -hmm. So it, it, can, it can be a very slow process. I've seen it happen. Yeah. But I've also seen a lot of people lose 30 pounds and then straight away, put it back on again. So it really depends on the individual. Yeah. And um, if the client can believe that they can lose weight, that's the key. Even if it takes one pound every two weeks, slowly, mm. slowly, slowly, if they can see progress and they believe they can get from there to there, yes. then we're in with a chance. If someone is so damaged, it's probably not best to work with a coach. Probably need some, as you said, some therapy. And also, you know, you made mention of, you know, um, some people say, okay, it's, it's my gene, for example, like um, my whole family, we are all fat in my family. And I've, I've heard this case before in which people tell me, oh, but I'm not, I'm, I'm not actually eating so much. I'm eating very little, but I'm still gaining weight. Maybe because it's in my gene. Without calling them a liar, they're just kidding themselves. Hmm. Like, look, when you don't feed people food, what happens to them? They starve and they lose weight. They starve. Yeah. They starve. Look at millions of people in Africa. Mm. No food, they starve. Mm -hmm. there's, an, there's not an obese person that is not being given food and stays fat. It doesn't happen. Mm. Mm. It just doesn't. So it's not physically possible to not eat food. I think it could be maybe a medical condition Oh, okay. There is a couple of a couple of medical conditions. I, I take it back. Not everyone. There is a couple of medical conditions mm -hmm. that whatever they do, their hormones can cause them to be obese. Mm. But we're talking 
such a handful of people across mm-hmm. the world. It's not even, it's worth mentioning, but it's not going to happen to the average person. Mm-hmm. But usually I hear it a lot. I've tried everything. I'm not eating that much food. I keep yeah. putting weight on. Mm-hmm. I can pretty much guarantee they are eating. They're just, they're just kidding themselves or maybe they're a secret eater. They binge and they think, well, if I don't think about it, it won't matter. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and people say it's my genetics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I don't know if you saw my post. I did a post on um, genetics load the gun, okay. lifestyle pulls the trigger. Mm-hmm. So genetics will account for maybe 10 or 15%, but the other 85% is down to the things we eat, mm-hmm. cigarettes, drinking, mm-hmm. lifestyle, pollution, mm-hmm. medications, all the things that we do as humans. Mm-hmm. So we can switch on or switch off certain genes based on the activities we do in our lifestyle. Yeah. So genetics, we've all got genetics to either maybe gain weight or be lean. We've all got them and some mm-hmm. are more luckier than others, mm-hmm. but you could have a, the obesity gene where you're more likely to put weight on, yeah. but it will only be activated if you eat too much food. True, true, like true. we've all got cancerous cells. Mm-hmm. We've all got cancer inside us, mm-hmm. but whether we get cancer usually depends on, if we smoke too much, drink too much, bad lifestyle, you know, that's not to say some, some conditions are genetic for sure, mm-hmm. but nearly all of them are based on the actions that we take. Yes. Well, thank you so much for that. So um, you, you provide a lot of information through LinkedIn, like we talked earlier, your book, um, the BHB, I'm uh, sorry, the GHG method, <laughs> the GHG method, sorry, uh, your podcast, the Health, Fitness and Lifestyle Show podcast, your YouTube channel and online coaching. So can you, can you tell me a little bit about all of these platforms and which platform is suitable for which clients? Probably all clients could come to LinkedIn, if, that, mm. if I'm honest. That's where most of my followings are. I post two, three times a day, my videos, everything's on there. Mm. Um, a great st- start for people would be to check out the book. I think you can get this for $16 or something. Yeah. Or the website, uh, um, YouTube is, is a, all my videos are on LinkedIn are also on YouTube. So mm-hmm. they're almost the same. But if you like watching just videos, go to YouTube. If you like videos plus comments and interaction and building your own business, LinkedIn would be the best platform. But mm-hmm. link, I haven't got what I call a following on YouTube. I've got like 300 followers, so it's not much. Mm-hmm. It's, it's fairly new. Mm-hmm. LinkedIn is where... I spend most of my time in the day. Most of my clients are mm. 99% of my clients are on LinkedIn mm. and that's where they come from. So for anyone with a young or old, go to LinkedIn and come and find me there or the, yeah. or the website, gavgillibrand.com. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm the Gav Gillibrand across the board, YouTube, yes. LinkedIn, the book, the website, everything. Yes. I'm going to place all of this show notes. I'm um, sorry. I'll place all of this information in the show notes for this episode. Um, your Instagram, your YouTube channel, your um, link to your book, and also to your website will be placed in the show notes for this episode. Great, so, thank you. What 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 word of advice would you give someone out there who is struggling with weight issues? Track your calories. Mm. That's it. Start tracking your calories. You have to know what's coming in yeah. because the reason you're overweight is you're eating too much food. Mm, mm, so we have to start tracking the very thing we need to reduce. Yeah. Start tracking your calories. That would be yeah. the very first thing. Yeah, so one has, to be, one has to be accountable for each calorie that one takes in every day. Yeah, and we can track it on your phone. There's mm. different trackers on your phone. You can scan them, type it in, find out what you're eating, record everything. Mm-hmm. It's like if someone was in debt mm. or trying to save money, what would be the first thing we would do with them? Start tracking where you spend. Yes, yes, yes. That's when true. You need to know what you're spending your money on. Mm-hmm. You need to know your outgoings, know your incomings and your outgoings and where you can budget. You need to start mm-hmm. budgeting your finances. Mm-hmm. You need to start budgeting your food, know what's coming in, exercise, and then we can start to plan it. We can either increase it or reduce it depending on the weight you've lost. Yes, that's true. Well, thank you so much, Gav, for everything I've learned from you from this episode. I really appreciate it. I'm going to please. No, you're you- welcome. I'll place all of your information in the show notes for this episode and I encourage everyone to get the book, The GHG Method, and also to connect with Gav on every platform, especially on LinkedIn. Thank you so much. Awesome. Brilliant. Thank you, Tyree. Wow. You made it to the very end of this episode. Thank you so much for listening. I'm grateful for your time, your love, and your contributions. Subscribe, like, review, and share this podcast. God bless you. Bye.